Welcome to the Student Ministry Podcast. This is episode 71 of the Student Ministry Podcast. My name is Steve Cullum. I'm your host for this episode of the podcast, and I'm so grateful that you are here. Whether you have been tuning in podcast after podcast, listening to all these interviews with youth workers and updates from me, or maybe this is your first time, I'm so glad that you're here. Today for episode 71, we're going to be talking to one of my former students, Zach Ryer. Zach uh, was actually a sixth grader when I started at my previous church. Uh, it was my first uh, full-time youth ministry, was able to start that church, um, not start the church, start the student ministry uh, from the ground up. It was a brand new church. I came on board about uh, four or five years after they started the church, um, and Zach was one of my first students at that uh, at that ministry and been able to see him grow through the years and now as an adult and all the things that he's able to pursue. Uh, one of those things is his new uh, music career that he's kind of doing on the side, um, kind of in response to a lot of what he's been uh, experiencing through his life, um, through some depression and anxiety, through some uh, loss within his family. And we talk about that today. We talk about um, how that affected him through his his time in youth group, his through his time as a teenager, uh, what was beneficial to him as as a student, and then also how he's able to uh, come on the other side of that, and now um, how God has been able to use that to hopefully uh, help other people and and kind of see the other side of all that stuff that he's been through. So um, I hope today is a, a great conversation for you to just listen in and hear some insight from someone who's who struggled in those areas, and also. So maybe you can grab some things uh, that you can you can take away for your own youth group as well. But before we jump into any of that, we want to thank our sponsors of this episode. Our first sponsor is G Shades. It's a youth ministry curriculum and teaching strategy focused on helping students see everyday life situations through the lens of the gospel. G Shades has options to fit everybody. With three plans to choose from, this curriculum gives you the resources that you need to do what you want to do better. Do you simply need message outlines, discussion guides, and games? That's just $16 a month. If you're looking for higher production value, including bumper videos, Instagram devotionals, and parent guides, that's $25 a month. And do you want an affordable youth ministry video curriculum that will help you increase your online reach during the pandemic? G Shades has you covered for only $36 a month. You will not find youth ministry video curriculum at that price anywhere else. G Shades does an excellent job of not just teaching students the typical things that we teach them in youth group, but allowing them to see every life situation that they go through through the lens of the gospel. G Shades creator Mike Haynes has actually been on the podcast for episodes 32 and 55. So if you'd like to learn more about Mike, you can check out both of those episodes. You can also head over to gshades.org, that's G-S-H-A-D-E-S dot O-R-G to download Season 2 of G Shades Youth Ministry Curriculum. And be sure to use the promo code T-S-M-P-O-D, that's for the Student Ministry Podcast, that's T-S-M-P-O-D at your checkout to receive $5 off your order. G Shades, seeing life through the lens of the gospel. Our other sponsor is Men Hub Youth, which was actually developed by a fellow youth pastor. Men Hub Youth helps you store and track your student, staff, and parent info, as well as attendance for your events. There are a lot of features, but today I want to talk to you about birthdays. Birthdays are always such a great time to honor students and even pray for and connect with parents. You could see a list of all the upcoming birthdays in the next week every time you open Men Hub Youth and even get a notification at the start of your day to remind you if someone in your ministry has a birthday today. On its own, the app is only $5 on iOS or Android, and you can use it forever on that one device without ever paying any more. But if you want to sync your database across multiple devices or with your leaders, you can sign up for MinHub Sync Service and support the Student Ministry Podcast by visiting MinHubSync.com. 
dot com slash s m p for student ministry podcast. That's m i n h u b s y n c dot c o m slash s m p. You can find the links to both G Shades and Minhub in our podcast show notes. Thank you so much to G Shades and Minhub for sponsoring this episode of the Student Ministry Podcast. And one more thing before we jump into this interview, I just want to encourage you to subscribe if you haven't done that yet on your favorite podcast app. And if that app has the ability to leave a review, I just want to ask you uh, if you enjoy what you hear and if you enjoy what is going on here, uh, please leave us a positive review and also consider sharing this with other youth pastors out there, other youth workers out there who you think would enjoy this content. Also, be sure to follow us on all social media. All those links are going to be available in the show notes. Now, let's get into this interview with Zach Ryer. Hey, Zach. Thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Steve. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I we talked a little bit before we started recording and just share with you that normally mm-hmm. I'm, I'm talking to other uh, youth pastors and youth workers. Um, we like to start off with a simple question of what your story is. So people uh, that are listening um, would love to know, yeah, how's, how's God kind of brought you to the point where you are today? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I grew up uh, in... Northern Mass, Southern New Hampshire, and um, uh, church has always been a big part of, of my life. My parents always brought us to church uh, every single Sunday um, for, you know, with my grandparents, and then I was in, you know, the kids' uh, was Sunday school and, and, and choir and a congregational church. Uh, for a long time, and then uh, I ended up going to a, a Christian uh, middle sc- elementary school and middle school, and uh, that's kind of where I learned more about uh, God and Jesus and just faith in general. And and uh, I believe it was second or third grade at Easter time they would take us to a movie theater in Lawrence and show us all the Veggie Tales shows and. <laughs> And what was it? Captain Bible was that the guy with the purple? Oh, yes, it's it, Bible Man. Bible Man. Yeah, yeah. I had his cape <laughs> and his mask. Nice. And they would show us certain movies. Like I remember one time uh, seeing this movie uh, with the, the, actually the captain from uh, the Love Boat. <laughs> was it the Love Boat or Gilligan's Island? Either one. I don't remember. But I got to meet him there, and he did a movie with Hayden Panettiere, his old brother. Uh, you know about finding God in uh, as a as an elementary school kid, um, but every year they would ask if anybody wants to dedicate their life to Christ and and to come down and you would pray and you know, get a Bible and stuff like that. So uh, I believe my second grade or third grade is when I officially accepted Christ on my own as a nine ten year old kid. Um, and yeah, and then um, I moved around to different churches and, and just kept growing and learning in faith and, and you know, and led me to multiple internships with, with different churches and helping me find my passion for a lot of stuff and a lot of amazing relationships coming through where I went to, to school and to, and to church and the Christian faith. And it led me to a really awesome Christian university down in down in Lakeland, Florida, Southeastern University. It's, it's the biggest Baptist college in the country, and I'm eight years removed from there, and I still have tons of friends. So, uh, so you know, it's, it's been a it's been a great twenty six yeah. years in the faith. So that's cool. So I know that um, normally we want to ask about people's ministry um because i talked to a lot of other youth pastors and youth workers and stuff yeah. you have volunteered in a number of different uh youth groups and ones that i've led and then other youth groups as well um what have you done in terms of like youth ministry specific since since you've been graduated from high school like what different ways have you been involved <clears throat> in youth ministry since i graduated high school well <laughs> my my second semester of college down in florida i unfortunately had an injury and uh, I remember you and I had a conversation 
uh, about three weeks before I left saying that you were looking for an intern. And I remember I was going to drop out of classes because I couldn't continue the semester. And I was like, hey, you still looking for an intern? And you're like, yeah. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll start next week. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what? Um, so I got to do, a, a you know, my second internship at RCC, you know, the first one back in high school with worship team and, and this one with the youth ministry where I, you know, I got to do a, a lot of fun stuff for the youth group and, and, uh, you know, help you just, you know, take over some stuff. And, and so I've been able to do that and connect with the kids and get to meet kids. And then even when I did my, uh, intern, my residency out in Colorado as a tech, uh, and creative arts resident, I got to do a ton of more, uh, with the youth group there um and it's where i really loved it like i i'm still friends with a ton of the kids that were my students three or four years ago you know they were all my my little my little sophomores <laughs> and now they're all graduated high school going to their freshman year of college which makes me feel old now you know a little <laughs> bit of how i feel <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so i still but I got to connect with so many kids, and especially one of the big things was I was able to bring really two of the kids that I lived with in Colorado during my residency when I, I lived at a very nice family's house that they let me stay there for months for free. Um, I They really didn't go to youth group that much, but since I was going to youth group every night or every Sunday – I drag him with me. I'm like, let's go. You're going to youth group. I don't want to go. Well, I don't care. You're going. <laughs> and which is, you know, good. And I'm happy I was able to bring him back in. And, you know, he ended up playing in the, in the band and stuff like that. But yeah, I just got to connect. I felt a lot. Um, I felt like I had a lot more to offer more in the residency to the youth group out in Colorado than I did when I was an intern for you back in, in New Hampshire, just cause I was able to connect more with these, these kids and we had a lot in common and, you know, they were really awesome kids and they all had hearts for God and, and, you know, I got to just connect with a ton of them and yeah. Mm, cool. Cool. And you also have dabbled into, and like you said, the, the tech side of things yep. and yep. creative arts and stuff like that. So what, what have you done in that kind of, world of, of ministry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so like I said, I went to Southeastern and my degree is in, is in film and video production. Um, so because of youth group, when I went to youth group, I was able to be in the, the first ever youth band where I played keys and then I came back and sang. But when I did, sometimes I'd had to learn the audio so I could control all of us during band practice if we didn't have a sound sound person and so that kind of just got me interested in starting then I would do it for Sunday morning um, and then I did an internship with my local TV station where I got to do more um, and so it developed into a passion to where I wanted to go and, and so I've been able to work for different companies doing audio visual um, and then I a life bridge. I was able to be the tech and creative arts resident where I was running sound, doing different stuff for them. And yeah, just a lot of fun. Cause, cause you know, if you can't hear the pastor, then how are you going to learn? <laughs> you know? Good. So that's cool. And I love that. Uh, yeah, you started developing some of those, those interests and passions, like when you were in high school, yeah. um, and was able to explore some of that stuff. And yeah. so I love that, that our church, like both churches that I've served at, um, that you've been able to come on board on and different levels and they've just encouraged younger people to like develop yep. those passions and discover them and, and just start to use them. So I, you know, uh, the other youth pastors out there that are listening to this, like they already know <laughs> yeah. that's why they're in youth ministry. But, <laughs> but I think Zach, would you say like you're, you're living proof that like the reason why we encourage our churches to like take on younger people is because, because of what you've been able to experience yourself. Yeah, definitely. Like one of, one of the 
not. I'd say issue. One of the things that shocked me when I did go out to Colorado for my internship was that the times that they had the youth group were originally in the morning. So there was no way for the students to go to service, which growing up, I always wanted to go to service because how are you supposed to grow with what's going on in main church when you can't even go? And how are you supposed to interact with those people? Because as soon as you're out of high school, you know, you're going there and you don't know really anything. But the main point of it is also that they weren't able to serve as much. You know, I would have to pull a high school student from doing a job in youth group when they really, when you really needed them, but I needed them more. So it took precedent over it. So, um, so yeah, so like it made sense that I was able to pull high school students and, you know, uh, was able to get a ton of them to, to learn. I trained a lot of these high school students on, mm-hmm. on lights and sound and uh, pro presenter. And so it definitely integrating high school students and even middle school students just to learn stuff is, is at a young age is definitely really good. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately it was after you left, but we were able to finally make that move. And, yeah. and, uh, and so now we don't have that, what I would call it competition anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that it's, it's not there anymore. And so students are able to attend, but also serve on yep. Sunday morning and yep. then also do the, the same thing for youth group too. Exactly. That's cool. So, so Zach, I know, um, I know a lot about the rest of your story yep. uh, because we've talked a lot over the years. Um, but I'd love for you to share as much as you feel comfortable, sure. um, a little bit of your struggle with anxiety and stuff like that, that you've had, um, for a number of years and, and how that has, I guess, kind of just shaped you a little bit. And then we can kind of dive into like maybe the, how youth group played into that, sure, but, sure, sure, sure. but I'd love to just, you know, have you share as much as you feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't a popular kid at all growing up. Um, after my parents decided that they wanted to put me and my brother into the public schools before we went into middle school, uh, is kind of where everything turned for me. I had no issues in the Christian elementary school. Uh, but as soon as I went to public school, a lot of things went downhill. Um, as soon as I entered middle school, uh, I don't think there was a day, a class, a lunch period, a bus ride that I was not harassed, bullied, hit, cussed at, you know, there was just so much um, that it, you know, it became extremely bad that I, you know, I was extremely suicidal uh, in sixth grade. Um, And that just continued through middle school and in high school. I mean, there was one time uh, and, and you know this, I, I'm not allowed to ski anymore because of all the injuries <laughs> that, that I have, have happened. And I remember there was one time I went skiing and I had two injuries. One was on like my left arm and one was on my right leg. So I was in a brace and a cast. So I couldn't use, uh, crutches cause the injuries on opposite things and it won't work. So unfortunately I was in a wheelchair for, for about two or three weeks. And a lot of teachers actually gave me a lot of grief about it and were kind of rude about it. And I had somebody who was supposed to push me around. And one time I was, uh, over by the nurse's station near the sixth grade wing. And there's like a, a flight of stairs, you know, wide stairs, about four, four stairs to go down. And uh, a bully of mine thought it'd be funny to uh, when I really wasn't paying attention because I was waiting for somebody to come take me to the elevator. Decided it'd be funny just to take the wheelchair and uh, push me right over the flight of stairs. Um, <clears throat> and so, <laughs> yeah, that that really destroyed me because I laid there for like ten minutes before anybody came out and helped. Like none of the teachers. Like there was only like maybe two, two or three classrooms that were like right by that stairs, and I know two of them were like, 
One was a library and one was like an extracurricular room, so nobody was in there, but the math teacher never came out and looked. Um, nobody really came out because unless it was class time to change classes, nobody really went down that part of the hallway. And so I just laid there for about 10 minutes before somebody came and helped me. Um, face down, glass broken, uh, glasses broken, yeah, and, uh, you know, wheelchair on top of me. And uh, so that really pushed it to where I was extremely even more depressed. I'd be called names every single day. I don't know why I was picked on. When I got into 7th and 8th grade, even the 6th and 7th graders who I had no clue who they were, would make fun of me. Um, so that just led to a lot of depression, a lot of mood issues for me, a lot of suicidal thoughts, a lot of, a lot of you know, saying I'm going to do this. I remember one time, I think it was either 8th or ninth grade, you played some sort of movie at youth group, mm. and it had such a negative effect on me that I was in the back of the sanctuary under four or five chairs curled up in a ball crying. And like you had to, you know, call my dad and to come help and everything. Cause I was so upset. Um, and there was just so much and in high school, it got even worse. A point I was in a mental institution, mental hospital for, for five or six days because I had attempted suicide. And because I was in a junior ROTC in high school and I was in my uniform and I had walked into the bathroom at lunch as a freshman and two seniors were in there and they decided to stay, laugh at me in my uniform. You know, I'm a bigger guy and I was a bigger guy in high school and I had a you know clean face and so I was very chubby, you know, very baby-ish face looking and so I didn't fit the mold of what a normal ROTC member would be. And they decided to stay in the bathroom, make fun of me when I went to the bathroom, and they threw trash, toilet paper, um, garbage. They just threw a ton of crap at me. And, um, and so when I left the bathroom, somebody made fun of me in my uniform that I thought was a friend. And... That just pushed me over to the edge. I went straight to my guidance counselor. I told her, listen, I'm leaving. I'm going home. I'm walking home. And I said, I'm going to go kill myself. And so that led to going to my therapist, who she didn't do anything for me. Um, I never found the right therapist until I was you know, 24, 25 years old. It took a long time. But... I ended up in the mental hospital for five or six days. Um, you know, I had to be pulled from school. I had to, to continue my education. So I was in a high school dropout. I had to go back to school for, uh, like one or two days a week at the beginning. And then I would go every day for, you know, somewhere between 16 to 90 minutes and work with an aide, just doing my, schoolwork and stuff like that. And then by the time my first full semester of freshman year ended, they had brought me to a uh, an alternative school where I did a lot better. Uh, I ended up graduating with a 3.6 and was valedictorian of a four-person class. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll still take it. But, um, but I was still depressed and, and stuff, but not as bad. Um, uh, when I went to college, I had one bout of depression. I remember there was just stressful week and, and it was, I think it was midterms and I just was depressed and, you know, I was, I'm definitely a mama's boy and I was really missing my mom. It's the first time I've been away for so long, you know, they're up in New Hampshire and I'm down in central Florida. So uh, that happened, but then the next rig, big, out of something was when I was in Colorado doing my residency I had to talk to the youth group about 
a taboo issue that you asked me to do, and I agreed. Um, I regretted doing it after the fact, but now down the line, I don't regret it because it has led me to a lot of other things um, and to doing a lot of things I never thought possible. Um, so the taboo subject was suicide and depression. Um, and so writing my speech, I had brought up memories that I had pushed so far down that I forgot. Like, I mean, I have a really good memory. Like I can remember, like if you asked me to tell you what I did 20 years ago or like a stupid event, like something weird, like. I'll tell you, and I I know. I mean, if you get ask me to take a test, I'm gonna fail it. But I can tell you anything. But these memories were so negative and so dark and so evil that I pushed them down so far. I forgot about them that when I wrote my message, they brought them up so much that the devil just completely overtook me, and I gave the message. And I think that night I was driving home, I was crying, I was upset, I was multiple times about to just turn into oncoming traffic, about to turn my car into a tree because I had become so depressed from just bringing all that up that it completely destroyed me to the fact that I had to ask for a week off for my residency. I flew back home from, from Colorado to New Hampshire and my mom could tell there was something extremely wrong, like worse than before. And, you know, I had to end my residency after six months just because I, I needed my family. I needed my mom. I needed support. I had you out there, but you're, you know, we're so busy with, you know, a huge youth group and everything that, and I didn't want to put that pressure on you either because you had helped me, get through so much of middle school and high school, Um, you know, so, but I I didn't really have any support out there. I had a therapist, but, you know, like I said, I had, it wasn't the right one. So, um, so yeah, so it led me back out to New Hampshire and, and then it, it led me to start writing poems and stuff like that, which has led me to, to some awesome things that I've been doing. Uh, recently mm. and uh yeah. yeah that's cool that's cool we're gonna get into a lot of the stuff that you've got going on now uh and just a little bit but um if you don't mind i'd love to take us back to your time within youth group but sure. also maybe even you know soon after youth group to um during those times when you're struggling yep um we have a bunch of youth pastors and a bunch of other youth workers that are listening to uh, this podcast. So like, what are some things that, that would really help other youth workers who, I mean, mental illness, mental anxiety, all these different things are, are running rampant in our world today. Yeah. Um, it's getting worse and worse, especially with the pandemic and everything else. So um, this is clearly it, like, if you're listening to this podcast and you don't think you have anybody in your youth group that is struggling with this, um, I would just encourage you open your eyes because yep. it's it's very much there. So um, everybody probably knows that it's there. They they struggle with it. Um, from your perspective, you're not a, a mental health professional, no. <laughs> but you've you've lived it. Yeah, uh, you're currently still living it and still going through it at some level. So. What are some things that other youth workers should know as they as they put together your youth group, as they run their ministry and connect with students? What are some tips that that other youth workers should hear from someone who's who's lived that life? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, you can't control anything. You what you can do is you can be there for these people. You, Steve, have, oh, I'm going to cry. I'm going to start crying. Have saved my life more times than you know, just from being there, talking to me, picking me up, taking me out to breakfast, going to hang out at your place, playing video games. You know, I think there was one point in, in high school that we had a standing, like, every other Tuesday or something, I'd we'd have dinner and play video games for hours. 
And that was, we didn't talk about anything besides, you know, basic stuff. And that was, that meant a lot to me. And that, that really helped me in the long run. And, but, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I don't know how to speak for today's kids, you know, because, because of the whole woke community and the whole, you know, everything that's going on, safe spaces and everything, you know, so I don't know, I don't want to speak for today's kids, but I know for, for me, you know, there wasn't that kind of stuff and you're supposed to, as a man and in New England, especially in, and, you know, growing up with a family that is from Boston, you know, hard Italian roots on one side where they just hold grudges for everything. And, you know, an Irish South, you know, Catholic South Boston with mob ties side to the <laughs> other family. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> yeah, but, probably not. We don't want to get the podcast taken down. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just say there's a chance that there's, you know, Famous mob people would have my name because I'm family. Um, but that kind of stuff, they never showed, you know, emotion. And the same, same on, uh, on my dad's side, you know, it was, you know, German, German background, strong German roots, Scottish. <laughs> they don't show, you know, so I was, and, and my dad was always never one to really show emotion. My mom would. But my dad didn't. So for me, I always felt like I shouldn't. But some of these kids, you know, you know, they're going to not trust you. They, for me, I'm very stupidly, extremely trusting. Like within a couple days, if I know you, I'll spill my guts most likely. You know, I will tell you everything, you know, which isn't good. But in this situation, when trying to connect with with a, a student, you know, you know, I mean, there are stories you told me that you probably have never told another student, you know, about you, your growing up in, in Illinois and stuff that you went through and and stuff like that, and and that really helped me to connect with you and helped me to grow and trust you more. And it's, it's just all about it's all about trust and just being there for people, you know. It's just. You know, just let them, you know, be a, be like a confessional in the, in the Catholic Church. <laughs> Don't put the divide there, Just but mm. just take them out to coffee and just let them spill their guts. And then from there, see what you can do for them. Because mm. um, that's all you can do. You can just be there for them and listen and hope that they open up to you, you know, and, and just be there and, you know, even text them and stuff like that. I mean, I went through a doubt of depression earlier this year uh during covid unfortunately um the last 20 months or so not been very good to my family uh my mom was in a an airport accident in february of 19 uh, she had got off the plane and the steel door that holds the that keeps the elements away had um fell and hit her in the head so she became very depressed because she could no longer work. She could no longer drive. She had to sit in the dark all the time. Um, and so her depression kind of led to a family depression because we were all very sad about that. Um, but then during the pandemic, you know, we were all depressed. I had written more poems. Uh, and then unfortunately, this past October of, of 2020, um, two days after her 57th birthday, my mom was diagnosed with stage four uh, esophageal cancer um, on October 13th. One month later, on November 13th, she was admitted to the hospital for pain. Um, and 13 days later, something like that. Yeah, 13 days later, she was she passed away on November 19th. Um, and for me. When she passed, because she was in so much pain, both with the cancer and with her head trauma, I felt relief because she was no longer in pain. But then as the months went on, you know, Christmas and, and, and New Year, and I had been the rock for my dad and for my brother 
because, you know, is when I finally hit me and I was able to break down and have that bout of depression, mm. um, you know, with her loss. And I'm still in it right now. You know, it's only, it'll be a year in October or in November. But, you know, there's things that I've done recently that, you know, like you said, we'll talk about in a minute, um, that have really helped me get closer to her um, now that she's gone. Yeah, so I think I think one of the, the biggest things that, and, and Zach knows this story because we've talked about it several times since that incident, but you had a, a grandparent, it was your grandfather, I believe, that was early on. Um, my ministry at RCC that, um, you guys asked me, or I knew about the funeral and I came to the funeral yeah. and, um, I was incredibly young, very green in ministry. It was my first full-time ministry. Um, and I remember not knowing anything of what to do, um, yeah. <laughs> had no clue what to do, was so nervous. Um, and I, I probably only said, I probably less than a hundred words the entire time I was there. Um, that might be stretching it. Um, but I just remember eating after you talked. So that's all I remember. <laughs> yeah. And I was asked to pray I think, at the, at the, at the, at the dinner. mercy dinner. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I still, we still talk about that yep. today and, and there was nothing that I said, nothing that I specifically did that, that helped you through that time. No. It, I think it was, it was just the fact that I was there. Exactly. And that's huge. Yeah. You want, yeah. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was huge. You know, um, I remember my grandfather passed on Halloween of 09 and, uh, you know, you were there for me. It, it hit me. It was the first big death I've had. Um, I was 14 years old. Um, so you were really there. And like you said, you were green. You had been at the church for two, maybe three years, but, you had already become such a big part of my life and my family's life. Like my mom always said that you and uh, you and Yvette are like her adopted kids because you know, you didn't, you know, you, all your family's back in the Midwest. And, and so, you know, you would come over for Thanksgiving and Easter and, you know, <laughs> eat the, eat the skin off the Turkey, which <laughs> you thought was weird. Um, Cause it is weird. It's not weird. It's delicious. Crispy <laughs> skin. is so good. <laughs> But we had you do that. And then, you know, when my grandmother passed, it was the same thing. You were moving to Colorado. Mm. But I got to spend the day with you and help you pack and stuff. So that really helped me. But the hard thing was that you were in Colorado during the pandemic when my mom died. And again, I hadn't had processed everything. But I had called you and you were more than willing and did an amazing job giving the eulogy uh, over Zoom to, you know, a, a CDC approved 55 people spread out <laughs> inside the funeral home, uh, for my mom. And I know she was looking down and loved it because everything you said was just, yeah, it's just amazing. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Well, it's been, it's been cool to walk with you through the years, Zach. And yeah. Pretty cool to see what God has been doing with all of this recently. Uh, so um, I, for you guys that are listening, I, I did tell Zach, I was like, Hey, I want to come on the podcast. I want you to talk about your story, but I'll give you a chance to plug what you're, what you're doing. <laughs> so uh, here's your chance to plug. I know you got, cool. you got some cool stuff going on. Um, but yeah, like I said, that like, that God has kind of used all these situations that you've gone through Yeah, and you've not, let it, I mean, you've, you've had your struggles yep. like you've talked about, um, but Satan hasn't gotten his way. That's right. <laughs> and God's still getting his way. And now he's starting to use that yeah. not only to reach other teenagers that you've been able to connect with and everything, but now through some music. Exactly. So, yeah. What's, what's that all about? So like I said a little while ago, um, the night after I gave my message on suicide and depression at the church, I had pulled into the driveway of the people's house I was living at, and I just started writing multiple poems. And even when I moved back, I would be up till two or three in the morning, just sad and depressed. And I'd just start writing these poems. And, and, you know, in youth group, I was, you know, I sang in the youth group and from, you know, in high school and, and I was on worship teams and, and I just, 
love music, and I actually, before I had gone to Colorado, uh, I had created uh, a band with some of my guys, and we toured Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, uh, you know, and, and then I, I, I left the band. But I had been missing that, and so I started kind of taking the poems and putting them into song, you know, more song form and laying them out. And uh, one of my best friends, um, Taylor Specht, who is one of the best guitar players in the world. Uh, I don't care what you say. <laughs> I believe he's one of the best. I can vouch he's really good and that entire student band still amazes me because when I remember when you guys first started we like, were awful <laughs> it was like two and a half hours and we couldn't even get through one song yep that's true and now they are some of the best musicians that I, I know I'm gonna blame Kevin for that because Kevin was completely green at playing drums he had no <laughs> clue and now Kevin's one of the best drummers I know uh you know and Taylor was only starting out on guitar too mm -hmm. then and now he's just so good so good you know he he co-wrote the f four songs with me uh and we're actually writing eight more songs right now um but i had written two songs and i was like well let's you know put this to music and we did it and then um my mom died and i wrote that song when i wrote her song i wrote it in 45 minutes and I wrote it, came up with everything, and, uh, you know, I ended up recording it in March um, with uh, a company in Massachusetts called uh, Boy and Dog Studio. Uh, Jordan over there, he's amazing. Um, he made me sound really good, much better than I am. And uh, <clears throat> I had recorded that because uh, Mother's Day weekend, on Mother's Day, was my birthday plus Mother's Day and the day before, we had gone down to uh, the beach down in the South Shore of Massachusetts to spread my mom's ashes. And so I wanted a music video to share. And now, like I said before, I'm in uh, do video work and stuff. So over the summer during COVID, I took all our home movies and converted them to digital. And me and my brother created a music video to go along with the song. Um, and uh, it's mostly home videos of my mom when we were babies and younger and stuff like that. And then, you know, I went and shot an actual music video at the beach for it uh, to put it in there. And so I released that on Mother's Day um, to a couple couple hundred views by Tuesday, over 5,000 by Wednesday. And by the time I went to bed Sunday night, it was just shy of 40,000 views and 300 shares on Facebook. Hmm. Um, which was amazing. And the amount, the messages I got from that were crazy. Like there are tons of people saying like, this means so much to me. Like I lost a parent young too, or, you know, yada, 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 whatever. But it meant so much to me that I was able to affect so many people with this song that I had. And so I wanted to put that out in an album. Um, so I decided to record three other songs. Um, Two of them are about suicide and depression and kind of like one is called Can't Take the Bullet Back, which I'm going to plug my Apple account, you know, in my <laughs> my stage name. However, I'll let you know now there's an E next to the song Can't Take the Bullet Back. And I promise you there's no swears in it because Steve had called me and said, Zach, why is there an E next to it? I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, just listen, dude. There's no swears, I promise. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just because the word gun and bullet are in the song. So I had written uh, that one's about, you know, you can't take words back. And it, sometimes people are going to say stuff, even though, you, you know, you can't take it back. You know, you don't know what somebody's going through. And the second song is called Where Do I Go? And it's about trying to find yourself. Like, do you are you going the right way to God or are you getting pulled in the wrong direction by the devil? And then there's a love song just cause I wanted four songs <laughs> that I had written years ago. Um, so I recorded that and I decided to uh, sell it as a hard copy. I did all the production myself um, with my buddies and I sold it uh, to people and asking money, $5 for it. Uh, 
but because I was doing this for my mom and I do everything for her, um, all the money that I raised was going to Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute in Boston. And so that made people give more money, which was very <laughs> generous of them. I ended up selling over 200, about 200 hard copies of my CD, which because I didn't have a CD copier, <laughs> I had to do each one individually loading it into my laptop, <laughs> which thank you to my brother because I'd say he did over half of them because I was at work till 6 o'clock at night and I hand delivered over 140 of them because I wanted to save money on shipping and and so I was I raised about fourteen fourteen hundred dollars so far for Dana Farber. I'm still an official fundraising partner for them, um, and so I'm still trying to raise more money for Dana Farber in my mom's name, you know. Um, but yeah, but I've been able to release it on on Apple Music on Spotify. Uh, it's on Pandora, it's on Google Music, which is now YouTube Music, I think. <laughs> uh, but it's it's under my stage name. It's Dante Nazaro. It's D-A-N-T-E. And last name's Nazaro, N-A-Z-Z-A-R-O. Uh, the reason I went with that is um, my last name is Ryer. And there's a professional wrestler who was in the WWE named Zach Ryder. And so anytime you would type my name in, his stuff would pop up. So, and people would get confused all the time in thinking I had a D in my last name. So it was just confusing. So I went with a stage name. And um, again, like I said before, it's all for mom. Dante is the name she wanted to name me originally. Uh, my dad said, no, <laughs> he said, you can name our first pet that. And then of <laughs> course we got a dog when I was five and, she was like, we can name it Dante. And my dad's like, Zach, what do you want to name it? I said Coco, and so it was Coco. Um, and then Nazara was her maiden name. So, you know, I just – it sounds cool. Uh, I like it, and I've been, you know, I've been very blessed with with three awesome friends that recorded the album with me. Um, came up with some awesome drum and guitar parts that I never would have thought of and, and changed my life because I was able to do this. And, you know, I – I just, it's just amazing, and it's, I do it all for her. And so, hopefully, hopefully, now that I'm in, I'm in Florida and they're back up in New Hampshire, you know, we'll still be able to write and record. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm hoping to have the full story album where it goes from "Can't Take the Bullet Back" to you know a couple more songs about about suicide and depression to a middle part where there's where do I go? What am I doing? What is what is this to, to a, a happy kind of not over the rainbow top happy, like, you know, like Kermit the Frog, the little <laughs> rainbow connection. Um, but more into a, like a skillet switch foot type vibe of a song where you are talking about God without really bringing up him, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. you know, kind of not throwing all the Christian words mm. at people so more people will download it and stuff and then they'll look into my history and maybe they'll be able to find uh, uh, God through there but it, you know more like a switch foot thing where you're talking about you know like like a mess of me or, or a hello hurricane or, or something where mm-hmm. where you're talking about God without just mentoring Jesus and every other right. line so yeah yeah that's cool. That's so cool. And, and I love the fact, like, you know, we mentioned the, the student band earlier, like that's, you know, a couple of those guys, that's, that's where some of your strongest friendships have come from. And yeah, 12, and now, 12 plus years. And now they're able to, you know, help with the album and stuff like that too, which is um, so cool. So I think, I mean, you never know what like the impact that that you have on someone long term like even giving people opportunities yeah like that like you know i knew you know with kevin and and uh taylor like just having them an opportunity to, to play in the student band and now all of a sudden they're amazing musicians that are able to help you out yep. not only with your with your album but also through life exactly yeah uh, kevin and taylor are two of my best friends in the world Uh, We're very, we're very close. Um, And, you know, um, me and Taylor see eye to eye on, on 
I, I want to say almost everything, um, you know, from from sports to religion to politics to just everyday life. We're very, very, you know, on the same page about everything. And we're very close. And especially him and Kevin, when my mom died, were, were there for me. And every all the depression I've gone through and everything, they've just been them there for me. I mean, I knew Taylor before we joined the youth band and before he started coming. Because like I said before, I was in the original youth band. Um, and then I was bullied by, by one of the members into quitting uh, because he had said that I was being replaced. And of course, I just quit without talking to you. But <laughs> then we had conversations like, what did he tell you? And why didn't you tell me? <laughs> But it led to something better because yeah. everybody else left the band mm. and uh, we did, you know, guitar practice. And, you know, I still have both of the guitars you gave me in my closet right now. And um, I was like, oh, I want to go rejoin the band. I'm not a singer, but they already had a piano player. And, you know, a couple of events led to the other two singers leaving. And as a freshman with really no experience, I had to really quickly learn how to lead worship and that led to some awesome things where I was able to lead worship more and 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 just uh you know lead worship and do this music and and uh you know with with Kevin and Taylor and like I said I've known Taylor a long time we we played baseball together we never played on the same team <laughs> I know we we played each other multiple times and then we even umpired uh, a lot of baseball games together in, in middle school but it was just really cool to know somebody that was, you know, that I already knew and just was able to develop this friendship and and uh, let it blossom into, you know, one of the, not only just one of the greatest Christian guys I know, a very faithful guy, but one of the best guys that, you know, I know. That's cool. So, Zach, I know people are going to want to find your music yep. and connect with you online. So where's the best places for them to connect with you and maybe ask more about your story? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can go to my Facebook page. Uh, it's Dante Nazaro Music, uh, D A N T E N A Z Z A R O Music. Uh, that's my Facebook page. Or you can go to my Instagram, which I always forget what it's under. It's either under that or Ride Dog 95. Uh, I know my Twitter's under that. Uh, it's R Y E D O G 95. Uh, or you can just message me on TikTok under the same thing. Yeah, I, I post some music stuff on there and some quirky things. Um, <laughs> or, yeah. Cool. Do that. Cool. And we'll have all those those links in the show notes as well. So um, you guys can just click those in the, in the podcast show notes. Zach, it's been awesome to have you on the yeah, podcast. Thank you, Steve. I had a, I had a blast. Cool. And, uh, yeah. Man, God continue to bless uh, your ministry, even though, you know, it doesn't look like a lot of the the same as a lot of the, the youth workers that we are, you know, talking to on a regular basis. Um, you still do have a ministry and, and God's going to be able to use you uh, both in personal relationships and maybe through music and who knows what else. So may God bless yeah. all that. Thanks, you. Thanks for having me. Well, I want to tell you that one of the greatest uh, benefits of doing this podcast has been the ability to interview a couple of my former students, which has been so awesome. Uh, I got to interview Alicia Cohn uh, several episodes ago and now Zach. And just to, to be able to see as a youth pastor, you know, um, many of you who have been in this, even if it's only been like a couple of weeks uh, to several years, you know, it's so awesome to see what God does through your students over the years. So uh, yeah, it's just been so awesome to, to be able to see that. Um, so I want to thank Zach again. Be sure to check all his links and everything in the show notes, along with the links of our sponsors. Be sure to check out G Shades at G S H A D E S dot O R G to download season two of G Shades Youth Ministry Curriculum. I'm pretty sure G uh, Shades season three is going to be dropping pretty soon. Uh, you can also use the promo code T S M. P-O-D to get an extra $5 off your order. And also be sure to check out MinHub Youth at MinHubSync.com slash S-M-P. So that's M-I-N-H-U-B-S-Y-N-C.com slash S-M-P. And uh, you're going to be able to support 
MinHub, but also support the Student Ministry Podcast. Thanks to both G Shades and MinHub for sponsoring this episode. We're going to be back again next episode with more student ministry talk. But until then, we just pray that God blesses your ministry and all that you do for the kingdom.